The songs known as shanties today often evoke a vision of sailing replete with romantic notions, of life unmoored from the dull labors of landsmen, of buoyant sailors in pursuit of adventure, and of carefree enjoyment of wind and wave. If ever we begin to wake to reality and remember that the old-time commercial mariner's vocation contained its share of desperation and abject toil, these dimly remembered songs, now sung in leisure time, persuade us to forget again, for a singing subject would seem to be a jolly one. A realistic understanding of historical mariners' lives, their actual work, and the nature of the songs they sang while performing their tasks, however, compels us to revise these perceptions. Shanties were rooted in work-singing practices of black people of the Americas. They were among those practices which, modeled on African approaches but taking new shape, were developed through the common experiences of alienation and enslavement, and which came to cohere as an African-American culture. As in today's romantic visions of singing sailors, the singing of enslaved Africans at work was once mistaken as a sign of unqualified joy before Frederick Douglass revealed that slaves sing most when they are most unhappy. A branch of the African-American work song complex, already widespread among laborers on land and being a particular form and method of call and response singing that managed both the practical needs of people working in concert and the psychological needs of their circumstances, extended to maritime environments and grew to at last reach the decks of sailing ships in the 1830s. The genre crossed ethnic boundaries in socially diverse port contexts, such as that of the job of stowing cotton in the cargo holds of ships. Just how this genre of song, these shanties, and their accompanying semiotic frame came to take hold among ocean-going mariners outside the African-American community is a story of rich complexity. That story includes the role of technology, which always shapes what people do in their daily lives, including when, how, and why they sing. Sailors, in particular, were beholden to an array of technical devices and operations that shaped the course of their lives at sea, and their singing may not be understood fully without that preeminent technological context. Hauling on heavy lines of ship's rigging was one site for the application of shanty singing, and perhaps the work most readily visualized. Hauling tasks were finished within a matter of minutes, however. Moreover, such was not constant labor. Do me, Johnny Volker, the potion's never sober. Do me, Johnny Volker, do! The task that required the heaviest and longest labor at a stretch was the work of raising anchor. Today's images of the Age of Sail, whether because they portray vessels from the classical age prior to the 19th century, because they are derived from photographs of ships from the tail end of the sailing age, or because they emphasize military vessels rather than merchant vessels, most often present the anchor-raising device known as a capstan. It is with irony, therefore, that the variety of anchor-raising technology most common aboard merchant vessels of the 19th century appears infrequently in cultural memory. This piece of technology was a device called a windlass. Lamenting the miserable labor attached to working the heavy windlass for hours, whale ship crew member Robert Weir wrote in his sea journal, Such a ponderous thing is only fit to be buried at the bottom of the sea. At the core of sailors' shanty singing were those countless hours seeking respite through shared vocalizing at the windlass. The windlass was the veritable altar at which the merchant seaman was compelled to worship, to pour out his feelings along with his sweat. Within the space carved out by its motion, the place of shanties solidified, and the shipboard branch of the phenomenon was enabled to flourish. From at least the 16th century, the common ship's windlass long consisted of a wooden barrel turned manually by means of wooden bars called handspikes. 
These hand spikes had to be continually removed and reinserted into slots in the barrel of the windlass as it was rotated by multiple men. Such a windlass can today be seen on Mayflower II, a reproduction of the vessel that carried English settlers to North America in the early 17th century. Maritime labor made a great leap forward with the invention of the brake windlass. On this device, seesawing levers, known as brakes, are used to turn gears attached to the barrel. The idea was first patented with a design by Tyzak, Dobinson, and Robinson of North Shields in 1832. Their original design employed two pairs of brakes, set perpendicular to the barrel. Later designs employed a single pair of brakes set parallel with the barrel, following an 1837 patent of Pau and Fawkes. The dual-action lever design of the brake windlass brought far greater smoothness and continuity to what had, for centuries, been a clumsy and often disrupted operation. Kinesthetically, the action for working the windlass became more like that of operating early 19th century ships' bilge pumps. The same action applied to pumping the old-fashioned fire engines which African-American fire companies worked to the accompaniment of singing. Although from today's perspective, the brake windlass may appear as an obvious machine, one can imagine the revolutionary improvement it made to the lives of mariners. By the late 1840s, during the era of packet and clipper ships, and just in time for the gold rushes and great intercontinental migrations, the brake windlass was established as a device of choice in merchant shipping vessels. Perhaps contributing to the brake windlass's frequent absence from cultural memory, neither Richard Henry Dana in Two Years Before the Mast, nor Herman Melville in works like Moby Dick mentioned the device. The experiences on which these author mariners based their familiar works occurred in the decade before many vessels began to be fitted with a brake windlass. Charles W. Morgan, now the only extant wooden whale ship, was built in 1841, the same year in which Melville set out on his whaling experience. It's no surprise, therefore, that the Morgan did not begin her working life with a brake windlass. Yet, by the Morgan's third voyage, begun in 1849, she had acquired a brake windlass. Whaling vessels came to use brake windlasses even more than did cargo shipping vessels, and up to a later date, for the windlass was necessary in whaling not only for raising anchor. Whaling crews required the windlass to haul aboard the enormous sheets of blubber and other parts flensed from whales, which were often heavier than anchors. An artifact of this history, the Morgan's windlass on display aboard the vessel at Mystic Seaport offers a rare glimpse of this technology. While the brake windlass remained an important tool for many decades after its establishment in the 1840s, anchor-raising technology continued to develop concurrently. As early as 1856, James Emerson's patent for a new anchor-raising device requiring fewer hands was praised for its ingenuity. In this design, a below-deck windlass apparatus was driven by a capstan above deck, as seen here on the 1882 ship Joseph Conrad of Mystic. In the 1880s, steam engines, or donkeys, were increasingly fitted to windlasses. The Charles W. Morgan acquired a donkey engine in 1886, for example. Purpose-built steam windlasses followed. By the turn of the 20th century, most large ships were carrying windlasses operated by an engine. A significant portion of the heavy labor on shipboard was thus phased out, and with it, the singing that had been embedded in the work. Nevertheless, the brake windlass continued to prove useful in smaller commercial vessels up through the 1920s and beyond. Manual windlasses served alternative uses and provided emergency functionality in fishing trades when using an engine might lack sufficient control or immediacy. The schooners and barkentines used in the Grand Banks fishing trade, in particular, made great use of brake windlasses, although typically these were devices smaller in size than the classic models that revolutionized labor in the previous century. Comprising a discreet genre of shipboard work song, shanties developed during a later period than many imagine. The historical record of shipping in the 18th century is devoid of anything like the songs that came to be known as shanties. 
vocalization with shipboard labor in the Western world prior to the 1820s consisted mainly of short cries or rhythmic shouts to coordinate jerking on lines or the hand spikes of the original windlass. There was a time, however, when the emerging shanty genre coexisted with older fashioned chants. It's during that period of overlap and transition that one can see most starkly the correlation between the shipboard technology and its accompanying vocalization. For where the old cries of yo, heave, ho persisted, they were found in ships that still carried the handspike windlass. The new style of work singing, shanties, makes an early appearance in an account also containing one of the earliest observations of a brake windlass put to use. In April of 1837, the American packet ship Quebec sailed from London to New York. On board was the Royal Navy Captain Frederick Marriott. Having been retired from sea service since 1830, Marriott was then traveling as an ordinary passenger, however, and shipboard technology had developed since his period of sea service. As the Quebec left port, her crew raised anchor using a brake windlass. Marriott expressed his surprise on seeing the device, which he was encountering for the first time. When I cast my eyes forward, I could not imagine what the seamen were about. They appeared to be pumping instead of heaving at the windlass. I forced my way through the heterogeneous mixture of human beings, animals, and baggage which crowded the decks and discovered that they were working a patent windlass by Dobinson, a very ingenious and superior invention. It was seven years of silly Sally. Spent my money on Sally Brown. Oh, Sally Brown, she is real pretty. While the crew pumped, they sang. Singing with sea labor, Marriott indicates, was usual. However, his language suggests that the song on this occasion, Sally Brown, was a song of a new type. The one they sung was peculiarly musical, although not refined. And the chorus of Oh, Sally Brown was given with great emphasis by the whole crew between every line of the song. Sally Brown would become one of the most popular shanties throughout the remainder of the Age of Sail. Its form follows a two-refrain structure that characterizes the majority of shanties. This peculiarly musical type of singing soon became so well known that, when setting out for a passage in a packet ship from Liverpool to Philadelphia in 1848, some of the passengers themselves took part in working the windlass and requested a crew member to sing. The resident shantyman, or lead singer, struck up across the Western Ocean. The passengers, Irish immigrants, were so moved by the shanty that they began to sob and were rendered incapable of helping further with the work. Don't you cry. 
classic shanties like these became the soundtrack to the golden age of American sailing, marked by the hard-driving Yankee package ships that carried goods and passengers across the Atlantic, the fast clipper ships rushing around Cape Horn, and the New England whaling fleet that roamed remote parts of the world. To heave all night and pump all day across the western ocean. Oh, Stormy, he is dead and gone. Hurrah, storm along. A memory of the early 1840s and the Black X line of packet ships included the grieving yet optimistic shanty, Storm Along My Stormies calling it a wild kind of thing. The song rehearsed tropes common to a number of shanties that memorialize a great personage. Storm Along was remembered nostalgically as that good old song during an 1848 whaling voyage to the South Pacific. And a writer who sailed on the coast of West Africa in the early 1850s noted that Storm Along, when he heard it sung at the break windless, frequently gave rise to a train of reverie in my mind. American sailor G. E. Clark described heaving the windlass to the singing of shanties, including Storm Along, in 1859, as the bark Guide was leaving Boston. Down the rigging they leapt into the windlass breaks. Then, as they felt the old emotion that they were at every stroke of the brakes slowly parting their last hold on Yankee land, they broke forth in a shanting that made the sleepy crews of numberless coasters turn out in quick time. Later, when leaving Bombay in an American clipper, Clark mentioned shanties at the windlass again, including the well-known song of The Wild Missouri familiar to audiences nowadays as Shenandoah, often sung today as a gentle love song hardly imaginable as a shanty. Resetting the wild Missouri to the work of the windlass brings its work song character back to life. For seven long years, I was a Frisco trader. Hurrah, you rolling river. For seven years, I was a Texas ranger. Ha ha, I'm bound away on the wild Missouri. After a century and more since working ships' crews regularly sang while operating the windlass, the knowledge of how to do it is practically forgotten. Much about the process and the feeling of the experience, taken for granted and therefore not well documented, cannot be obtained from the historical record. It's only through recreating the experience in the present that we can fill in the gaps. Unfortunately, few operating vessels today carry a break windless, and existing specimens in the style of the 19th century are fewer. It's in this context that a unique opportunity to recreate the experience presented in the form of the barkentine Gazella Primero of Philadelphia. Gazella was launched from Stubal, Portugal in 1901 to fish for cod on the Grand Banks. Her career in that capacity lasted until 1969, at which point the vessel was too antiquated to keep up with the trade. After searching for a historic vessel to represent maritime heritage in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Maritime Museum, now the Independent Seaport Museum, acquired Gazella in 1971. 
She is now cared for by the Philadelphia Ship Preservation Guild. The Guild is a volunteer-centered organization that not only protects the vessel as a piece of history, but also maintains it for practical use. Gazella is thus notable for being one of the oldest wooden sailing ships still active. In her current form, Gazella displaces 299 tons and measures 177 feet in length overall. She carries anchors weighing 1,500 pounds. Her windlass, a massive apparatus of 5,000 pounds, was first built in Portugal, though little is known about its precise origin. Its iron castings, probably original, bear the mark of a foundry in Figueira da Foz. The windlass measures approximately 11 feet in length, and its barrel is nearly 2 feet in diameter. In 1922, a donkey engine was installed for use with the windlass, foreclosing the likelihood that shanty singing would continue to be regularly deployed thereafter. Fortunately, with Gazella's windlass undergoing a major rebuild in 2022, it was in excellent condition to function as a site of experimentation with some of the old practices and to capture them in this film. Gazella's windlass indeed may be the largest existing windlass still operable and suitably reflective of 19th century technology. Baskets full of Xiaolong Pao Rolled the cards and down Man, was you ever in old Hong Kong Rolled the cards and down All eating dim sum and drinking oolong Rolled the cards and down But the port in China I love best Roll the cotton down. Is the port of Macau that is the best? Roll the cotton down. Sailors had particular ways of fitting the shanty song form to their work actions. For example, when hauling on the ship's lines called halyards to set sails by hoisting yards, the crew matched the shanty to the action by hauling at two precise points during each choral response. In the case of the brake windlass, the crew did not work the brakes up and down in one action. Rather, due to the great weight of the load, the pumping action occurred in two parts. First, from high to midpoint, then, in a second action, from midpoint toward the deck. Frederick P. Harlow, an American sailor of the 1870s, was one of few chroniclers that did not take this detail for granted. The windless brakes worked like an old-fashioned fire engine, except that they were never worked from the extreme height to the bottom on one stroke, but on the contrary, were pulled down to the halfway point where it was necessary, on account of the heavy strain from the cable, to change the position of the arms in order to shove the brake to the bottom. Many hands were required to heave the windlass, ranging from about six crewmen for a small setup to more than 20 attested in large scenarios. Including others engaged in auxiliary tasks, a considerable chorus was available to sing the responses of the windlass shanties. The caller, or shantyman, took his position along the side of a break, where the work was less strenuous, so as to save his breath for his singing. This lead singer developed the use of his voice in a high register, employing sharp timbres and yelps, so as to remain heard among the elements and over the commotion and beefy chorus of the crew. The shanty's song needed to be modulated in tempo and atmosphere to match the changing feel of the work over the process. When raising anchor, the first part of the process was somewhat less laborious because it consisted only of hauling in the slack of the cable and then, with increasing intensity, pulling the vessel into position above her anchor. A livelier shanty like Goodbye, Fare You Well was appropriate for this section. Goodbye, Fare You Well, said Frank Bullen, a shanty man of the 1860s, was probably more frequently sung than any other shanty when getting underway, either outward or homeward bound. 
Later in the process, as the crew became more fatigued and the load included the weight of the anchor itself, slower shanties were called for. Mr. Stormalong is one of the stately old songs from the deep heritage of the genre. Its solemn character and lugubrious melody, more reminiscent of the blues genre than the musical language of light entertainment songs, suggest why many contemporary observers of shanty singing describe performances as mournful and plaintive. Numerous arcane details have a bearing on a given event of working at a windlass and singing shanties, making for variability across different events. Experienced seamen of the edge of sail were experts at managing heavy labor under the pressures of time, weather, and physical condition. Through this, they learned how to make singing work to their advantage. Shanties, though their qualities included delighting and distracting the mind, were not entertainment, but rather tools to organize the temporal, kinesthetic, and psychological requirements of the job. The experiment documented here aboard Gazella, while undertaken in the context of just one set of variables, has begun to provide answers to questions of historical practice, as well as pointing to further questions that have not previously been considered. Large, wind-powered vessels and shanty singing were technologies that lost their commercial utility in the early 20th century. From that point, society continued to value them as part of its maritime heritage. However, because maritime heritage organizations tended to focus on either the material preservation of historic vessels or the sailing of new vessels with modern methods, the historical practices of shipboard work and shanty singing were not compelled to function together in the way that they had evolved. In the last century, the two traditions of work and song diverged and developed apart. Most sailing ships' crews now operate without singing, while folk music performers, the inheritors of shanties, sing the songs with only a vague sense of their practical applications. With its dedication to preservation, not only of the vessel, but also the ways of the vessel, the Philadelphia Ship Preservation Guild maintains a platform to unite heritage technologies once again. Gazella's vintage windlass might appear to the casual visitor to Penn's Landing as merely an artifact of an old ship. Yet it's a living representative of our past, about which there is much we may still learn. That which Gazella and similar historic vessels allows us to experience teaches us not only about the ways of a ship. In this case, it has provided insight to recover shanties, from their fanciful and comical settings in movies and video games and return them to their place as a genre of American roots music and the cultural heritage of maritime laborers. The songs of the windless can return to cultural memory as those uniting cries of uniquely skilled workers who through sweat and sound generated the motion to propel the modern world. Oh.
fields of yellow corn. I'm bound for South Australia. Heave away, you rolling king. Heave away, heave away, heave away. Don't you hear me sing? I'm bound for South Australia. Well, there ain't one thing that worries. Standing on the foreign shore. Heave away.